This video is going to be about the normal distribution thought of as a single mean model. That is a model to predict future observations, but our model for now is going to be particularly boring in that our model is just always the constant, whatever the single sample mean is from the data. Uh, we're going to dive into this by imagining that we are, like we have been in the past, uh, interested in the mean of a population. We are going to, for a while now, though I have taught us methods uh, that allow us to estimate the variance, we're going to ignore estimating the variance right now. So we're going to say we're interested in the mean of a population, not necessarily the variance. Uh, we are going to start phrasing all of our models as normal distributions because of the central limit theorem. It tells us that the sample mean follows a normal distribution, at least approximately. So the question most statisticians have is then, if we're always interested in the mean, and the sample mean is approximately normal, why not just assume normal data right up front? Now, the world of statistics is starting to move away from this assumption, but it is still kind of the entry point of the way to think about modeling, and that's how we're gonna think about modeling for the rest of the class, is almost always assuming normal data because of this second bullet point right here. So, uh, I'm going to begin this presentation by reminding us what the likelihood of normal data looks like with respect to the mean, mu. Uh, it turns out an it's an extremely common functional form, as I was saying, because this is the most common way people approach um, statistical modeling. So I'll highlight for us that functional form that you'll probably see if you ever take any kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence course. And then I'm going to try to give us a um, plot that also helps us to think about what a single mean model is doing in terms of the data. Uh, I think at that point you'll realize how kind of uh, poor a single mean model is, but to be honest, it's the most common model people employ, so it's something you should understand uh, in various different ways. And then towards the second half of this video, we will do an example in R where we'll go, we'll go straight from the single estimate all the way up through a bootstrapped confidence interval. So much of this will look like things we have seen before, but I'm just kind of starting us out on a page we've seen before while walking us towards um, the idea of formally modeling uh, data. So here we go. Starting out, as we've seen before, we will suppose we have x1 through xn independent and identically distributed data that follows the um, normal distribution, which I'll just denote with the capital letter N, which has population mean mu and population variance sigma squared. Let's see the simplified log likelihood for this setup with respect to only the population mean mu, given all the data we have, is proportional to, and now I'm just skipping kind of to the end here, but it would be a good exercise for you to go through and see if you can recreate this functional form. Now this is the extremely common functional form that you'll see, or you might see, in some sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence course. So I'm just going to highlight it right now to remind us that this is our first likelihood function where we are thinking in terms of modeling as best we can all of the data we have. Now, it may be no surprise to some of you that the best guess for the population mean mu is actually just the sample mean, where you add up all the data and divide by however many there are. 
But what that's actually telling us is that mu hat is the single number that is closest to all the data xn in terms of squared distance. That negative out front doesn't really matter. Um, if you think of this just as some kind of quadratic function and you're either maximizing it to find the top of this u or minimizing it to find the bottom, either way you're going to kind of end up at the same point mu hat. So in terms of a model to predict future observations, we're really thinking of mu hat as a single number which is closest to all the data x1 through xn in some sort of simultaneously close way in terms of squared distance. Now, the simultaneous is really there to mean that, look, we have to uh, minimize the sum of the squared difference between all the data and the mean. And the square distance term shows up, honestly, because the like natural phenomenon behind the central limit theorem says that the sample means are approximately normal, so we went ahead and assumed normal data. The squared part here is just coming from the fact that we assumed normal data. And we assume normal data because of the central limit theorem. So it's really kind of this chain of logic that gives us the squared distance. But if you really want to get into it, uh, the squared distance is actually just easier to do calculus on, both for a computer and for a human. So if you need something a little bit more tangible than we assumed normality because of the central limit theorem, then just imagine that taking derivatives of squared terms is easier than taking derivatives of absolute values of terms because the absolute value has that sharp corner at zero. Okay, so there's our simplified log likelihood with some kind of intuitive understanding of what mu hat is doing as a model that it's a single number closest in some sense to all the data. But if we think about this, oops, in terms of a plot, specifically a histogram, I think it helps if you, now let's see, I'm gonna draw a kind of odd histogram here. So I have room to further my picture as I go. Suppose you have all of your data in a histogram that looks like this, and you want to ask, what is the single number along the x-axis that best represents all the data you have? Well, you could imagine for uh, pedagogical reasons that maybe mu hat is over here. Now, certainly this mu hat is close to those data, but is really far from these data. So it's certainly not closest to all the data in some sense. And in fact, that is not what the sample mean is going to be. By a symmetric argument, you could ask, is mu hat going to be over here? And the same sort of arguments hold that this mu hat is close to these data, but far from these data. And so again, you're not really picking for that value of mu hat, any mu hat that's simultaneously close to all the data. In fact, what you're going to get as the winner is the mu hat right in the middle of this symmetric data. Now you've got to be careful with you have some sort of skewed data because mu hat is actually going to be pulled pull, uh, towards the tails now the reason that mu hat might be pulled towards the tails for skewed data is the fact that the sample mean adds up all the magnitudes of the data. And if you have a skewed distribution, then those 
tail values are actually really high magnitude numbers and it will pull the mean towards them. But it all comes back down to this basic formula where the best guess for the population mean mu is the number which is closest simultaneously to all the data in terms of squared distance. Let's go ahead and jump to our example in R. I will just right off the bat load the library ggplot2 and I'm going to use the bike data set we have where I'm going to try to come up with a single best guess that represents the average number of rented bikes from this bike rental company. So I'm going to start by creating a plot that estimates the population distribution. Now we'll use ggplot relative to our data frame named df. We'll put on the x-axis the count, that is the count of number of rented bikes, and because the number of rented bikes uh, does not take on decimal values, we will make this a histogram. So the plot we get here is symmetric, though it's not terribly normal. The reason being, this histogram has somewhat large shoulders here and maybe small tails down here. Now it's certainly a small tail down here because you can't have negatively rented bikes, but a similar sort of pattern shows up on the right side where there's kind of a large right shoulder and then a small right tail. So as we get going through this R example, please keep in mind that this distribution we plotted first represents the population distribution of the um, number or count of rented bikes. That is inherently going to be different than the sampling distribution, which will approximate with the bootstrap method. Okay, so let's just use the function mean, since we know that the likelihood produces the sample mean as a solution anyway, we could just say that our best guess of the population mean number of rented bikes is 4,504. Now similarly, you could set up a log likelihood function for the normal distribution where you're only interested in the parameter mu and you should take in all of the data you have I'm going to write this maybe different than you would expect, but I'm only doing it through the temporary variable d because squaring things is actually a very complicated um, calculation on a computer. And if you're only looking for squares, then multiplication is going to be much faster for a computer to handle. So we could certainly calculate the mean, just like we did with the function mean, through optim, we're just doing it as an exercise here. Looking at the plot, 5,000 seems to be a reasonable guess without looking at the actual mean. 5,000 seems to be a reasonable guess of the population mean. We'll pass into optim the function ll normal. We'll use the method lbfgs. B. This is just one of the more modern methods and it is particularly good. We'll pass into LL normals argument x the count variable from the data frame df and we are interested in the parameter uh, from the element named par in the return from optim. You'll notice I'm specifying no upper or lower bounds here in optim because the population mean mu for normal data uh, can be any real number, so there are no bounds for the mean mu. And if you run this code, you'll get out the exact same number we got by just hand calculating the mean mu. Now, if this class were in person for the rest of the semester, I would probably make you all go through Optim for the rest of the course. 
as it stands, R has some built-in functions that help us estimate population parameters from all the uh, models we're going to be interested in for the rest of the class. So I'm thinking I might let us just use the built-in functions in R for the rest of the class, but if you particularly like the way that most modern machine learning happens, that is, through functions like Optin, then I encourage you to keep that going for the rest of class. Okay, so let's next estimate the sampling distribution of the sample mean. And this is using the bootstrap method as we have done previously in this class. So I'll just kind of cruise through this piece and you all can ask me questions in office hours if you need any of any help through this. So we just uh, produced a bootstrap estimate of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Now if we wanted to look at what that distribution looks like, we could, and now I'm going to make a density plot because the sample mean, different than the population distribution, can take on uh, decimal values. Now here is a plot representing the sampling distribution of the sample mean. You should pay particular attention that this is an entirely different distribution than the original population, though they both look kind of normal and are both symmetric. The sampling distribution here is much more narrow than the population distribution because we A, have a lot of data, Specifically, we have 731 observations, and the um, sampling distribution is really only trying to provide uncertainty about our best guess for the population mean, rather than producing uncertainty for the um, total number of rented bikes in the population. So we really got to remember as we go through this modeling piece that we have two distributions floating around. Above we have the population distribution and below we have the sampling distribution, that's the one currently plotted, from which we normally um, see, from which we normally get confidence intervals. We normally get confidence intervals from the sampling distribution so we'll just make a little note here that says CIs calculated from originally data, but most, more specifically the sampling distribution, to guess about the population mean. That is, we use the data to inform our guesses about population parameters. That is inherently the goal of statistics. Now, if from the sample means you wanted to actually calculate the confidence intervals, you could certainly do that using the function quantile as we have before. I'm just going to put them into a data frame here so that I can try to show you visually the difference between the population distribution and the sampling distribution. So here we go. Here's a data frame containing a confidence interval of, whoops, that's a typo. Okay, fixing that. That is a data frame containing a confidence interval of 90%. And now we could, let's do a trick I haven't yet showed you about ggplot. I'm gonna create an empty frame and onto it, 
onto that empty frame, I'm going to, in one layer, pass in the data frame of the means themselves and make a density plot out of that. And then I'm going to add another layer, which is a subtle layer named geom rug. I will try to highlight what that does for us um, next. And on this layer, I'm going to pass in a wholly different data frame. As you can see in the syntax now, this is what uh, it looks like to pass in two separate data frames, one data frame to each layer. So here we go. This plot's going to largely look like it did before. It is the sampling distribution estimated from the sample means. But down here, I've put what they call rug uh, geometries that indicate where the bounds of the 90% confidence interval lie. And indeed, if we look at the data frame containing the confidence intervals, we get 4,384, something just below 4,400, and 4,630, something just above 4,600. So indeed, these are the 90% confidence intervals. And you can imagine in between here and here is 90% of the most likely sample means that we would get if we were to repeatedly estimate the population mean. Now, to remind you visually how different the sampling distribution for the sample mean and the population distribution are, I'm going to plot those confidence bounds on the histogram of the original population. And I think it will help you see, or at least help keep in mind, that there is in fact two different distributions floating around here. Now here is the population histogram, because remember the counts can't take on uh, decimal valued numbers. A histogram is a better choice. And here is the 90% confidence intervals, confidence interval, which we calculated from the sampling distribution from the sample mean. Notice how narrow it is here when all we're interested in is estimating the population mean then because we have such a large data set, relative to the population distribution, we're pretty sure the population mean is somewhere in this interval. All this extra data is just not necessarily the population mean values. We are 90% confident that the population mean number of rented bikes is somewhere between 4,384 and 4,630. I hope this helps you see and remember that the single mean is just interested in estimating the population mean of some population distribution, and it's the sampling distribution that helps us quantify the bounds of a confidence interval of our best guess. The sampling distribution is really quantifying the uncertainty in our best guess of a population parameter.